Today's um, art lecture is with um, Steve Davis, who is um, who works at Evergreen. He manages um, the photo area. Good enough. It's more than photo land. He can't, it's a whole land he manages. Um, he also teaches. And he also is um, an artist and um, is well represented around the country in both print form in terms of books and, and um, anthologies, and then shows actively uh, primarily with um, Jim Harris in Seattle in his gallery. And um, the last show I saw of your work was the hippies um, pieces and, the, and involving Evergreen students, and I've noticed on your website that you also have done other kind of um, question and answer kind of inquiries with some Evergreen students as well. So his work is engaged, his artistic work is engaged with his teaching work and his work with students at Evergreen in a pretty alive and um, emerging way. So he primarily works in portrait and landscape. Um, and his work has appeared, like I said, in a lot of print media, so American Photo, Harper's, New York Times Magazine, Russian Esquire. Um, and he's in, his work is in a lot of collections, including the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, Seattle Art Museum, Santa Barbara Museum of Art, George Eastman House. And he is a former first place recipient of the Santa Fe Center Project Competition and two-time winner of Washington Arts Commission Artist Trust Fellowships. Um, I would say about the kind of work that this is a lot of accomplishment for the kind of work he does. Um, we w recently took a field trip to the Seattle Art Museum and saw the Martha Rosler early uh, collages. And though they look very straightforward and simple, and they, they integrate both um, magazine, like beautiful homes and gardens kind of magazines with uh, images from the Vietnam War. They were done in seventy two, early 70s. And though they look really straightforward and easy to do, and you've seen lots of work like it, it is a very difficult thing to do well. And so, and as a lot of the work we do, um, a lot of people do it. But the, some of the work actually has something either really specific or really tight that takes it forward. So there are a lot of photographers that work um, on portraits and landscapes, but Steve's work ha fits really well into a, a history of, a, of especially American uh, portraiture, sort of documentary, uh, street photography, sort of what's happening on the street, but also like um, Eagleston, or e what's his name, e what's his name, Eagleton, Eagleston, Eggleston, who, who has a, a kind of um, a distance on it, as well as an intimacy with it, and he handles that quite well. He's, um, he has a BS and an MFA from the University of Idaho. So let's welcome Steve. Thank you for being here. Can't hear you. I'll mention it. I'll mention it. Thanks for coming, everybody. I just realized that I'm more nervous speaking on my home turf than if I were somewhere else. Um, so, what they tell speakers when they're nervous is to imagine the audience naked and I'm put you on my Facebook that way. Um, so I feel better already. Um, I think Shaw summed everything up, so I don't have much more to add. But uh, now I'm going to walk through, um, let me see if this is all working. Okay, that's my name and my URL if, if you're interested. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the things that led up to what seems to be getting a lot of attention right now, which is captured youth, but also uh, photography um, in prisons in general, because it is revealing something that has been so successfully kept hidden and still is generally kept hidden um, from view. And then I'll also go beyond that with what that suggested in terms of future work. Um, for no real good reason, um, I'm going to present you with the very first photograph I ever took. Um, I was very proud of that photo. Um, I got in trouble for it from my mother because it didn't include a sibling. Um, 
So I've been kind of screwing that up most of my life. Um, but when I look at this picture, after all these years, I've realized a lot of the work I do now is the same, only I have better gear. Um, and so there are patterns that emerge in your work that when I was starting out, I thought, oh my god, I have to have a pattern. I have to have a direction. I have to be for this and I have to be against that. And uh, I'm not sure I did. You know, um, but a lot of it is organic, and then retrospectively, you see these uh, currents sort of come through your work at, at strange times. Um, so anyway, that's my picture of my favorite water tower that was taken from my front door. Um, so a lot of people, and I always kind of admire them, they've got a great cause. You know, there's Jacob Reese, the great uh, uh, socially concerned photographer from like the 1800s who was really concerned about the poor, and he found that, uh, and I hope I'm getting this history somewhat correct, uh, nobody wanted to read about it. So he became a photographer, because people wanted to look at the picture. So he was using photography in the service of a greater need. I'm not that person. I'm, photography's the greatest need for me. Everything else is like an excuse to get the camera out, in some respect. Um, as, a, as a college student, I'm sorry, I can't see this from here so well. Um, I was very interested in portraiture, and I did do a lot of portraiture, and I did a lot of everything as you're supposed to when you're in college. Um, this is uh, from a party. Uh, we set up a, a makeshift studio with an aluminum foil background because that was just so, I don't know what it was. And uh, I would get drunks like this. The poor guy peed his pants, but he didn't care. He was having a really good time. And so I was really happy to be able to take photographs like that. But at the same time, um, I was thinking, well, how am I going to do this in the future? Because as far as I can tell, people want portraits of people they know and celebrities. That's pretty much it. Um, or really boring pictures of businessmen, which didn't interest me. Um, so I just I didn't know what to do with it. Um, once I got out of school, I moved to the Bay Area. And uh, at that point, I was I just didn't know what to do with human beings, um, pretty much in all respects of my life, I guess, but in photography, too. Um, so I started um, projects uh, like this one, which was called Chambers of Commerce, where I would just run around the Bay Area and find interesting stores and photograph them. And this was from the Castro. Uh, nowadays, I suppose I could be in the shopping mall, but back when I took this, which was in the early 80s, uh, you know, this was sort of a unique unique space. I did discover that almost every place I photographed promptly went out of business. So like this was a great little restaurant in Berkeley and they closed the doors right after I got out of there with the camera, I think. Um, so I was very interested in space and uh, the, where people live and how they create these environments. And in this case, I was thinking of them as uh, almost these sort of theatrical stages with interesting props and that kind of thing. Um, and I did a lot of odd jobs, uh, all photo related, and I worked for photographers and uh, that kind of thing while I was down there. And I worked for this uh, photographer named Lois Tema. I, I was just her printer. Everything was, of course, darkroom. Um, and she took pictures, uh, at the time, just theatrical pictures of wannabe actors and actors. And so she'd get the guy and he'd you know, wear a cowboy hat in one picture and a, a business suit in another, or be a loving dad in a picture and that kind of thing. And I, I learned so much working for her because all day long I just printed pictures of people. And I recall that as far as I was concerned, I was far better technically than she was. But I didn't know how to work with people at all. Uh, I never actually watched her go out on a shoot, but I would just spend all day looking at how she worked with people and how she relaxed them, and that wasn't second nature for me. Um, I really kind of had to work at it, and so little jobs like that can be very helpful. Eventually, I saw an ad for a photographer slash teacher at a place called the Evergreen State College, which I don't think I'd ever even heard of. I went to school in Idaho. I never heard of Evergreen. Um, and, and it was a strange job because it had teaching, but they also wanted someone to go out and do photography, and they wanted someone with experience in new photography. Well, that just sounded awesome. I didn't know what it meant, 
but it was, sounded fantastic. So I get here and I go through the interview and it eventually becomes apparent to me that it was a typo and they wanted someone with experience in news photography, which I had very little of. So anyway, I bullshitted my way into the Evergreen State College, basically. It took like a year and a half, because first they hired someone else who said, I'm out of here, I can't deal with this. And anyway, long story short, I'm still here. I promised I'd be here a couple of years, and uh, I don't know, I kind of screwed up on my timeline there a little bit. Um, so, but I love portraits, and this is a portrait of a student from the early 90s, maybe 1990, named Panacea Theriac. She had a great name and a great look. And I got to use the college, hopefully I gave back to the college, but I got to use the college as a lab. And I would just experiment. And uh, at the time, there were some really great people in the publications office and who were just up for any crazy idea I had. And I'd come out with some real crazy ideas knowing that they'd want to negotiate back. And then they wouldn't negotiate back, and I'd be stuck with this idea. I don't even know how to do it. Um, so I found that to be really fun, and it really pushed me in a lot of ways, and I just wouldn't have been otherwise. So yay to Evergreen State College. Um, I became really interested in electronic photography or digital photography. Uh, it was just starting to suggest it might come in the future. I mean, it was that early. Uh, we had a computer that could freeze frame live television. Right? You, there weren't digital cameras and there weren't even digital printers. There was just no way to do anything with this work. But it really fascinated me and I kind of got very absorbed with the sort of cyber art, um, wanting to push film away. You know, was, film is old hat, I want to do something new. Um, this is a series called American Album, and these are all from television frame grabs, and I would, I can't believe I did this, but I'd just sit in front of my computer and watch talk shows, those really nasty ones, Jerry Springer, stuff like that. And I became kind of fascinated with them. Like, who are these people who actually want to put themselves on television to basically be ridiculed and abused? And I started thinking of them as a community and as a, a virtual community. Um, and that was sort of the beginning, I think, where I started thinking about populations or how people relate themselves or don't relate themselves. People are very different in public. They're not friendly. They're not terribly social. They're very reserved. But if they can go online or they have that screen of the television or the computer, or, you know, now it's Facebook, um, that's where you bear all. And it seems a little perverted to me. Um, so these are people who would, this woman would go on television knowing she would be mocked. I didn't make up these titles. These are from the show. Uh, I made the graphics for it. Um, and then I just created this big grid. So I was doing that and liking it for a while, and eventually, at the time, and this was in the early 90s I, still, um, cyber art or work along those lines, computer art, was always about one thing. It was always about itself. It was always self-reflecting, you know, this postmodern stuff. It, never, it was hard to actually work to do anything beyond talk about how we now communicate. It's always about systems of communication. Um, so I was sort of saved by like by this project, Captured Youth, um, where I got into it by accident. I didn't go into it because I was so abs absorbed by this. Um, I was hired to take some pictures of other artists teaching workshops in... Um, the Green Hill School, I think it was, uh, which is in Chehalis. It's not a school, it's a prison. Um, and uh, I said, hey, have you ever had a photographer teach a workshop? And Susan Warner, who's now the head of the Tacoma Art Museum, uh, she was the one spearheading the project. She said, no, but I think we'd like to do it. So I'm like, okay, uh, when do you want to see my portfolio? No response. Uh, do you want my CV? Uh, no response, nothing. Two years later, I get a phone call. We'd like you to do this now. It's like, you don't even know me. Um, but she goes, eh, we kind of like you. So, so let's do that. Um, by the way, if you've got a question, just ask it. Um, and if it's a really geeky question, that's fine. I, you don't have to be like, oh, that's not a cool question. You want to know what kind of camera I use? Fine. I don't care. I'll be happy to answer anything. 
Um, so I got involved with uh, you know, these juvenile offenders uh, to teach them. And some of the examples of what I taught them are in the Prison Obscura show. Like my name's on it, but that's not my work. Uh, that's work that students did in, in different workshops that I worked with. Um, and so if you haven't seen the show, if not for that, but it's a great show, you should see it. Hopefully most of you have. Um, where was I going with that? So I got in there and they said, well, you know, you're a photographer, so it'd be kind of cool if you also took pictures yourself, Steve, and we could use them for uh, fundraising, things like that. And I said, okay, well, what kind of photography do you want? And uh, they said, well, you know, kind of a day in the life thing. And I thought, I thought about it for a little while and thought, wait, these kids are living the day in the life and they've got cameras, so we'll let them do that. And I said, how about if we do something really crazy and I'll just make portraits as if they don't even, aren't even imprisoned. And to make it even crazier, I'm going to use an eight by 10 film camera. So for those that don't know what that is, it's a giant old fashioned camera that takes a negative that big. It's very slow, it's very expensive, so you take one or two pictures of somebody and you move on. Um, you have to be very careful, you have to really plan. Um, and I, I did that because uh, the people who get cameras like that pointed at them, are, it's usually a great sign of respect. So there's a certain theater to whatever kind of gear you use and that kind of thing. And I was thinking of you know, Richard Avedon's portraits, they're eight by 10. Presidential portraits are eight by 10. And last but not least, Playboy centerfolds are eight by 10. At least they were, I'm sure they're not anymore. Um, so I thought I wanna try to approach them with, with that kind of thing, uh, just for myself, just because I wanted to try uh, going back to something that was not electronic. Um, what I'm showing you here, I'm, my, what I'm speaking about is not matching the pictures I'm showing. I did research. Uh, what kind of photographs have come out of these places in the past? Because they're very secretive places. And I went to the Washington State Archives and I found almost nothing. And they were basically in shoe boxes. But they were pictures like this. These are like promo pictures, they're feel good photographs. They're very set up and they're very much operated by and for the man. Um, and that's what we had to look at. Um, all of a sudden kids get cameras, which was not easy. And there was a lot of cameras being taken away and stolen and crazy rules imposed upon them. Like you can go photograph that tree when the guard is with you, but only that tree. And then you gotta give me the camera back. You know, it's like crazy stuff. So it took a while to actually get it to where they could even have a camera in their room. And they just did some amazing work. I worked with a group of, I don't even remember, it was probably 15 students or something like that, um, who were pre-selected, not by me, um, as kids that could cooperate and would be interested. And it was an amazing experience because uh, most of these kids had never completed a single project in their life. And they had a mission with this. It wasn't just go take pictures, it was, take pictures and other groups, other kids were drawing pictures, other kids were making music all through the state. And it was an exhibition that traveled through some of the more at-risk uh, high schools in Seattle. And so there was a very simple mission and that was, you wanna let your friends know not to come here. That's your goal. And uh, as photographers, they were very curious about things. Um, and it was very difficult to know who took what picture but they all agreed with no arguing, no fighting, that everybody took everybody's picture. They were all accountable for everything. And it was just that easy. Having a camera in that place made them like the big men on campus. Uh, everybody wanted their picture taken. Uh, everybody wanted, they, they became powerful. It, you, they would get favors by giving someone a picture, or taking a picture of them. Um, this is an example of a self-portrait. I tried really hard to get them to uh, portray, maybe not what they would just portray with their friends because they were all pretty on top of their game when they were around their friends. Um, but don't be afraid to try to be maybe a little more vulnerable. And even though the other kids all saw these pictures because they were photographs, it seemed kind of safe and they could express themselves. And keep in mind, I didn't know they were gonna do any of this. I never worked with a population like this. This was all new to me. Um, this was uh, from the Ray Raymond Hall, which is uh, the juvie in Tacoma. 
So that place is, takes boys and girls, and uh, I worked with the girls. Uh, and that was a different place because the kids might only be there overnight or just maybe three or four days, and then they'd be out again. Um, but what I noticed and what I was told was that a lot of these kids that are there for two or three days, they're repeat offenders, and they keep coming back. And so they know them, and they pick up where they left off. And the saddest thing is, uh, guess when the population gets the biggest? It's uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, because they'll get a meal. So they choose to go there in some cases. Anyway, I couldn't photograph their faces, which makes it really hard to take pictures uh, without really phony, boring, corny stuff. Uh, and they couldn't photograph their own faces, so what I did, I thought, well, I'll get them pinhole cameras. So if you don't know, a pinhole camera is the most primitive of anything. It's a box with a pinhole for a lens. Uh, and it requires a very long exposure uh, because it's very slow. And the quality is interesting, but it's not high quality. So I thought if they use pinholes, they're going to be so blurry, I don't have to worry about faces. So they could do anything they want. But because they had to plan and they had to set up, not like the boys with their 35 millimeter cameras, um, they had to think more theatrically and more of, more performative. Uh, what do they want to portray for the camera rather than capturing something that's going on? Um, this is a theme that came up multiple times with boys and girls, and that's one of dominance. And the thing is, if you could hear them, they'd all be just giggling their heads off. They're having a great time. But still, that was the theme that would be coming up. You know, crazy double exposures by accidents, anything like that, just sort of helped give it more of a, this. It was more about uh, feeling and sensation and surrealism than about literally pinning down the, um, the geography of the actual space that they were inhabiting. Uh, so other than presenting this work through what was called um, Um, I'm spacing on what the title of the program was. The, the people that fundraised, like Susan Warner, who got this off the ground and got it into Seattle and in the Children's Museum and stuff like that. I didn't want to do anything with this work. It's not my work. I don't want to take credit for it. Uh, in comes Pete Brook. And Pete Brook is uh, the curator of the, uh, uh, the, the Prison Obscura show. And he writes extensively about prisons and prison photography in particular. Um, and he was very interested in the work, and he published it on his site, and he had more hits looking at anonymous photography than he'd ever had from anyone who had a name, um, which was surprising, I thought. He was very surprised by it. And so this was his idea of curating a show. He would find a back, dirty room in a bar, and he'd push pin them up. And that's all he cared about. And so the show we have here is because he partnered with someone who's a real gallery expert and knew how to do it right. So this is where it starts, but this was really fun too. You know, you just basically, you start putting it up at 3 p.m. and the opening is at 5 p.m. and then comes down a couple of days later. So this is mine. Um, I would go in with a big camera, one or two lights, and a helper, an intern. Um, tape some black fabric to the wall, uh, in most cases, uh, because I wanted to extract them and get permission, get releases, and photograph. Um, this was one of the hardest photographs I ever took. This is from, anything in black and white is the earliest stuff from 1997. Uh, I'd always done color, so actually doing black and white was like, that was sort of an experiment for me too. I mean, in terms of my own personal work, it was always color. Um, so I thought I'd give it a try in black and white. Uh, this kid was in the, uh, I don't remember the actual technical name of the, the area, but it was basically uh, the psychiatric ward. And it was a lot of screaming and a lot of banging and, uh, and a lot of drugged kids. And this kid was pretty drugged. Uh, he'd been in a fight the day before. He still had blood dried on his teeth, but the fight was apparently from the day before. Um, and he said, you know, I'll write you anything you want about this place, and I will tell them how bad it is. And I said, okay, but your picture's going to speak louder. 
from that. Um, so this was the picture that came out of that. This was Duane. Some of these kids I actually worked with closely as, as photographers in the workshop, others not. So the, he was in my workshop. Uh, he was a great kid. He was from the hilltop in Tacoma. Um, and yeah, I don't know what else to say. This is Mike, spelled with a Y. I don't know why I remember that. Um, a lot of these people, they're really sort of complicated. They're not necessarily what you think. He was a really sweet guy, and he got along with everybody, but he was a complete Aryan, complete neo-Nazi, because his family was. And he had all the tattoos and all that with him, which I guess he's going to have to carry around for a long time. Um, and, you know, he was kind of a tough white guy, but... Uh, once he was actually inside, all that seemed to just drop away and he'd just get along with anybody, or at least in terms of what I saw, and I don't pretend to have seen everything that went on. This is Stacy. He was also in the mental of the psychiatric space. Um, at this point, I'm sort of relaxing my rules, my self-imposed rules about the, the black background, extracting them from any context other than what their own bodies are bringing and their clothes are bringing into the scene. And I'm starting to feel a little more comfortable with actually photographing the space. Um, I always like this picture for a reason that I don't think anyone's ever noticed before. Can, I'll ask you, um, but it's just a light above his head, but it's also this awesome halo. I mean, I couldn't have asked for more. When this was the cover of a catalog that came out and they cropped the halo out and said, well, you can't crop the halo out, that's the picture. I'm like, oh, we hadn't even noticed. So maybe it's just me, but I like my halos. Um, and I sh the sad thing about this kid is he got out and uh, I heard that, I was told this from one of the staff members, he got out and he got in a fight, presumably to protect some lady, and he was killed. So he didn't last long. This is the intensive management unit from the Maple Lane School, which I'll bet no one even knows where that is. It's really close to here. It's in Rochester. That big water park thing, it's sort of right behind there, a couple miles in. It's beautiful. It's an awesome looking campus. Uh, it's closed down now, which I suppose that's a good thing. I don't know. Um, but that's where I was photographing it first. And so these guys, this is actually, to be completely honest, a composite of two portraits put together. Um, they did everything in shackles. They, if they were outside of their cell, they were in shackles. So I've got them. I got pictures of them playing cards shackled, playing ping pong shackled, which I'm guessing really helped them at their game. Um, and they were just very relaxed by it. The kid on the right, Jacob, I, he was very quiet. Never don't know anything about him. Uh, the kid on the left, uh, it was uh, wow. I've, I've got him recorded. I've, in fact, I think it's on my website. He's, he's, he's the scariest monologue I've ever heard. It's just crazy. So if you have any questions or anything, just I feel funny just talking. Um, color, eventually I decided I want color. I don't want black and white anymore. Uh, black and white romanticizes things, and it sort of creates this sort of layer of nostalgia to it. Um, so. I thought, I'm just going to go back to color. I just want all those nuances that color brings that we don't get uh, in black and white. So this is Adam. This is literally the first frame I took when I was out at, uh, um, at Green Hill. Usually the first frame is just garbage, but I think this was a good one. I don't know how long I'm supposed to go. I've got about 7,000 pictures left to show. No, I'm just kidding. Um, OK, all right. Maybe the Q&A will come earlier. Actually, I got a ton of stuff. Well, I'll go till 12.30, because um, I know you guys want to get your, your money's worth here. 
Um, people tend to think, and they don't even ask me because they just know that this is a set up photoshopped picture and it's totally not. Um, I was taking pictures, looking the other direction, you know, pretty sure I knew everything that was going on and uh, my, uh, my friend and intern who uh, now teaches photography and media in New Mexico, Carrie, uh, Carrie said, you gotta turn around. And uh, said, don't bother me. That's, I think I said something rude like that. Um, and goes, no, Davis, you gotta turn around. And I turned around and that's what I saw. And if you think about it, there were no opposing doors across the hallway. So they didn't get to look at anybody else. None of those kids knew anyone else was looking at me. It was just them, each individual. Um, and why wouldn't they look at me? I've got this big camera. I'm, they don't get guests in there ever. And um, I do want to say something about that. This is the intensive management unit. Um, they would be in their cells 23 hours a day. They could be out for one hour, but they could not socialize with anybody else when they got out. And they had no recreational tools. They had no television. They had a playground that had been closed for years. So that was their life. It wasn't necessarily for long. It might have been for a couple days, but up to six months. So it was bad. Uh, some of the kids would actually ask uh, to go there on purpose, though, because they couldn't. They just needed to get away from the general population. Um, so I somehow I got to see it without a camera. And I looked at that place and I said, okay, I need to change my rules. I'm not just photographing people against black backgrounds. I have to photograph where they're actually inhabiting and how they're living. And I knew they were gonna say no because what smart staff person would say yes? So I had a liaison and at the time, the whole administration was very uh, supportive of, of this sort of thing, which is rare and didn't last long, but they were very supportive. And I went and I said, I want to photograph this because it is the worst thing I've ever seen. And I think everybody should see that it's the worst thing I've ever seen. So I just laid it out on the table. I wasn't trying to be cute with them. And he goes, okay. I'm like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Um, so then I got to spend some time in the intensive management unit. That was the cell. That vignetting is because I had to use a super wide angle lens because it's a very tiny space. Um, you'll notice there's books on the table and a plastic chair. You only get the plastic chair if you're in school, otherwise you don't even get a chair. And school is totally optional. Um, and he's got some books. Uh, I'm not sure what my next frame is. Yeah, so that's another view of the space. And see, they sleep on a concrete slab. Now, Obama has just outruled, uh, outruled this uh, by executive action on the federal level. I just heard that or read that, uh, but I don't know what it means on the state level. Oh, um, solitary confinement for juveniles. Yeah, and that's, that's what this is, but nobody will call it that. It's called intensive management unit. I'm jumping around a little bit. This is a completely different space, and this is not intensive management unit or solitary. It's a much nicer space. Um, eventually, this work, I think Shaw mentioned, I got this award, and it was for this very work. Um, and so I got a little bit of attention, which was nice, and I had some money, too. Yay. Um, and then I had a, something set up with... Uh, the New York Times Magazine, which is a huge deal. I mean, they don't pay anything, but people would pay them to be published there. It's, you know. So they were gonna do a whole spread, and I've learned some important lessons. When someone says they want something, it means they want it yesterday. And I, I said, well, I wanna get new releases. I wanna get bulletproof releases, because these releases were done in jail, they could be challenged, they're done in pencil. Um, and so we had an agreement with the administration that if anybody used anybody's pictures, they would share that information with the other party. Well, the new administrator was not terribly fond of me or any of this work. And so at that point, she threatened me with the attorney general. Nobody was allowed to see this work. They don't grant permission for it. Um, and by then, the New York Times Magazine found another prison story to run, and they were gonna run too. So that flew by me. Um, 
so that kind of froze me up for a while, and I was a little hesitant to show the work, even though I didn't really admit that to myself. I made up excuses why I wasn't showing it, or I was doing new work, or something like that. And eventually, eventually, I got to meet up with a, a lawyer for the arts, and uh, the lawyer said, so they didn't give you permission to go into a high security cell with an eight by 10 camera, studio lights, and an assistant? I think they gave you permission. Okay, it's closed, you know. So at that point, I felt emboldened to try to show the work some more. And I did, and nobody ever challenged anything. Nobody ever questioned anything. I never, never had any issues in, on, on any respect. Um, what I'm showing here is Raymond Hall, um, where I focused mostly on girls. This is a girl. Notice that you don't get to see her face, because I, I couldn't. Um, not much of a cell, but I've seen worse. This was the dormitory. I think this was actually for the boys. And this is where some of them lived, I think for very short term. So they didn't even have a cell. You know, they just basically had this big room full of these little cots under a fluorescent light. It's like something out of a Kubrick movie. I would not want to be there. What? Focal link. Oh. I have to kind of guess at this point, but so it's an 8 by 10 camera. And so the focal lengths are very different than they would be for 35 millimeter. So I think it was a 240 millimeter lens, I think, uh, which would be a very telephoto for a 35, but actually is wide angle for an 8x10. But not super wide angle. And unlike digital, where you can actually go into the file and it'll tell you exactly what focal length you use with film, you know, there's, there's no record of that. Um, some of the later work I did was at a facility called Oak Ridge in Tacoma, and this was sort of a halfway house. So they were still under guard, they were still being monitored. It was, when they were in there, they were in jail. But they got to put on nice clothes and go get do a job during the day and come back. So they had a little more responsibility there. Well, when you see a boy blowing bubbles like that, just got to take a picture, right? They're very proud of their clothes. Even at a, I guess, At the Maple Lane School, they got to wear their own clothes. At Green Hill, they had more of a uniform. And they'd have the nicest shoes, you know, like fancy, listen to me, fancy Nike shoes. They were really fancy. But they were expensive, nice shoes. And I remember saying, let's walk across, you guys got your cameras, let's walk across the grass and go, look at this. And they look at me, well, we can't walk on the grass. Look at our shoes. <laughs> so vanity is everywhere, you know. Um, I just realized I'm not seeing what I'm supposed to be seeing on my own screen, but I guess that's how it is. Um, so I don't, I'm not seeing what is supposed to come up next. So by Oak Ridge, this is 2005. Uh, it's quite a while ago, but I started in 97. Um, and at this point I thought, it's time to retire. There's just... I've done it. Um, until I can go into some other level or, or some other depth or from some other perspective, um, I need to kind of let this one go. And now I'm not getting Let me try this again. It is not behaving itself all of a sudden.
Oh, okay, is that right? Are we on the right screen now? There we go. So I put down all the, the incarcerated stuff. Um, although I am optimistic, my fingers are crossed, I'm hopeful that I will resume again, but within the adult prison in Shelton. So we'll see. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, the work that's downstairs outside Gallery Photoland, I was hoping it would be the new work from Shelton, but the bureaucracy is like incredible. So even though they're all in favor of it, somebody on some desk in Olympia needs to sign something and they haven't done it. So, so I'm stuck on that. Um, for some reason, after doing this work, it, it seemed that I was photographing people that were disenfranchised, that were sort of on the edge, that didn't have the advantages of, of what most of us take for granted. Um, I did some work with the DSHS. They had a whole photo project around the state called the Heart Gallery, and the DSHS is huge. It's like they take care of like a third of the population of Washington or something insane like that. Um, and so my job was to photograph people with functional disabilities. And again, I used an 8x10 camera. I never worked so fast. They thought I could do a whole series in a day, and I practically did. This woman, I forget all her ailments, but they were massive. I mean, she was blind. She was in a wheelchair, and she had other problems on top of that. And I think, uh, I think she was... Uh, had some intellectual disabilities too. Um, but God, she was just so happy. She was the most pleasant person I can think of. This woman had some disease. It was weird because they wanted me to photograph these people because they had disabilities, but they would be violating their privacy if they told me what the disabilities were, which is a really weird thing to be in. It's like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. I don't know what your issue is. Um, but her fingers were literally rotting off. It's like she had something going on there. Um, and she was in a lot of pain. So some of you might know, uh, I'm going to blame this on Judy. Judy Nunez, who used to work here at the college, I guess I should get closer to the mic, huh? um, told me about this place called the Rainier School. And it was she did an internship there. And it was this mysterious place outside Buckley, which is near, very close to Mount Rainier. And uh, it was for uh, developmentally disabled, uh, massively de developmentally disabled people. And she told me this story about this woman that was treated like an animal that lived in the basement, and you got to go see it. And so I wrote, and I wrote, and I called, and eventually they said, you can come in and photograph. As far as her story goes, as far as I can tell, it was totally untrue. But it got me into this environment where these people, are they're not imprisoned, but they are managed by the state. And so in that sense, it is just like incarceration in terms of you've got state bureaucracy taking care of you. So Rainier School was a beautiful campus and very humane, at least maybe not always, I'm sure, uh, not in all respects. I know abuses have happened, but it had a bowling alley. It had its own garden. It was self-sustainable at one time, I think. It had a school. The population aged out. They shut the school down a long time ago. It had a little store. And the, this was home to these people. It wasn't like they were trying to get out in, the mo in most cases. Today, they would never be in a place like that at all. But back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, this is what we did with people like this. And so they have no place else to go. And again, I would drag out the 8x10 and uh, lights. It was insane. I learned a lot shooting here. Uh, they take cues. They're all different, uh, but they're all there for a reason, and that's because they are disabled. Uh, some had no sense that there was another person present, like me, completely in their own world. Others would take uh, my suggestions so literally that I remember one, you know, I told him, can you pretend you're a statue so that you don't move? And I'm tearing down the equipment, I look at the guy and he's still the statue. I had to release him. And I, I think I really need to pay attention to these things. This was Larry. Larry was literally left on, I say literally, this is the story I was told. 
literally left on the doorstop, doorstep of Rainier School when it first opened back in the 30s. He was the oldest person there. It's kind of interesting. I don't. This work has not seen a lot of attention. The captured youth stuff didn't get a lot of attention either uh, years ago, and now all of a sudden it's like, oh, this is the conversation. This is what we want. We need we need illustrations when we have this conversation. So there's all these people doing it. Thanks to Pete Brook for sort of rounding us all up. Um, that conversation isn't happening, and maybe it doesn't need to. I don't know. With uh, developmentally disabled, it got some. In this country, anyway. This guy's favorite band was Wild Cherry. You talked to him for five seconds, you would know that. Wild Cherry, play that funky music, white boy. This guy's an identical twin. I got another picture of him with his brother. Um, I always liked this picture. It's one of my favorites because he was he was just very awkward, but in this picture, he just looks like a dancer. He just looks so in his own space and just, just beautiful. I like the story behind this after I made the picture. Um, I was told that the superintendent kept insisting she get rid of that hat because it's not normal. I said, yeah, you get us go to Evergreen sometime. <laughs> I've literally seen that hat on campus. <laughs> Your sisters. The chapel. Yes. I know. I think it's been threatened to be closed before. Um, as far as I know, it's still there, but it's imploding. So there's a lot of empty buildings, and the old buildings are like one flew over cuckoo's nest kind of, kind of buildings, um, and they're not used at all anymore. Now they're more like these little pods. You've got kind of a centralized living room. And then it's like really bad assisted living, you know. It's not jail. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I worked with a liaison. Um, I can't remember her name. Uh, the superintendent or whatever his title is said, you work with so-and-so. And... -so. and uh, so none of these people are their own legal guardians. So it's always a family member, so there would always have to be some kind of permission like that. And I think I've shown you a picture maybe that I didn't have permission on, but I wouldn't publish it. Um, yeah, so we had to go through all that. And a lot of, I've been told this before with other people, and what I have found is you wear out your welcome pretty quick in places like this. And I think part of that's because I'm really slow so like, I want to be there like two years. And they're like, whoa, what do you mean? I'll be there like two hours. So when the, my liaison finally retired, that's when they said, we don't want you back. I said, OK, fair enough. Uh, these were the identical twins. Um, they had been separated most of their lives for reasons I don't understand, kept in two different institutions in the state, but not in the same. They finally reunited them, and they hated each other. I mean, they fought, they couldn't keep them in the same room. I said, boy, I really would love to take a picture of them together. And, they go, oh. and uh, so they tried it, and they were very nervous. And you don't see it in this picture, but they drank about eight Pepsis each. And uh, they were just having a great time. Um, I call American Falls my hometown, but it's really not. I only lived there like three and a half years. But it was my high school years. It's when my parents died. Um, so it was sort of the final family place. Um, and my dad died, I think, in 2009. And for some reason, now that I had absolutely no reason to ever go back to that town, 
uh, I wanted to go back, and I wanted to go back and photograph it. Um, I had this sort of love-hate tension with it, and probably more hate, to be honest, than love. Um, so I just decided, if I thought about it too much, I probably wouldn't have done it, but I decided to dive in, and I would just take these trips and spend a couple days there, and just sunrise to sunset, just go anywhere I could, ask anyone to take their picture. I'd go into rooms, you know, offices, stores. Uh, and to me, it was sort of a growth project because I wasn't just doing portraits, I wasn't just doing landscapes, but I was um, merging them together in a way that wasn't quite so uh, prescriptive, I guess. It was just whatever I wanted to do. A couple of Mormon missionaries. At this point, I'm digital. I have a, a medium format digital camera, so it's a really big digital camera. It's slow, but I'm used to 8x10, so it's incredibly fast. It's all, it's all what you reference. Um, so it was a good quality camera, and I'd usually get off the tripod, and I'd usually work really slowly with it. I found this picture on the John Stewart show once, which was awesome. They'd actually changed the faces, so they thought they could get away with it, and so I got a lot of money for that. <laughs> Just go into the bar, you know, meet people, and talk to them long enough to set up and take pictures. Oh, this is sad, because my dad bought a new house, and he bought it right on the other side of that cross. Now, he probably would have loved it, but I thought it was, you know, a little much. <laughs> this is called Waiting for Parade. I had to get a picture of kittens in for you guys. I know you all like kittens. I think this is what passes for a gang in American <laughs> Falls. It's a small town in Idaho, agricultural, fairly rural. Um, I'll, just, that's, I'll leave it at that. I thought it was interesting. Those are Alice Cooper tattoos. And then I found an old picture of him on Facebook from like five years ago, or not long ago. And he didn't have the tattoos, so he got those as an old guy. <laughs> I'm going to talk about Lance. What, how are we doing on time? Do I have a clock somewhere? All right, I'm going to speed it up. I started doing landscapes partly because I don't have to negotiate with people. And whenever you work, especially in systems like prison or something like that, it's pretty endless and it's really tiring. Um, so I just thought landscapes would just be free and relaxing. But what I didn't realize was landscapes are really hard because they've all been done better than I can do many times. So it's really hard. But this one was just like setting, it just set the table for me. I mean, I just. I literally followed the smoke, and I found this. And this is ongoing. You know, I started it years ago, and I still go out and just keep adding to it. This is one of two 100-year floods I photographed within a span of two years. So... Sometimes I just want to stay busy. I'm, no pun intended. That's not why this title is up. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, maybe it is. I just want work for my hands to do. So I, I did a lot of back and forth with finally finding out who is in charge of the Olympia Brewery. And, uh, you know, I bothered them to the point where they just said, like, here's the key. Just leave us alone. So I spent some time photographing the brewery.
there's a little sign above the phone that says that thing about uh, may there always be work for your hands to do, and that's where the title came from. There's places in the brewery that look like they told the people to get up and walk out, and there's just stuff on the desk. There's all sorts of stuff. Telephones. Um, it's a kind of a, a bizarre place. That's the computer room. If you ever went on a tasting tour, this is where you got to stand around and drink the beer after suffering through the tour. Oh, and I don't have a credit slide here. So you mentioned hippies, and I wanted to get back to portraiture. I'd done enough sort of distracting things, I thought, like the brewery. Um, I wanted to get back to portraiture, uh, and I began thinking, you know, the one thing that I don't even see anymore, I don't think about, but I'm always immersed in it, and that's students and people of that age. And, and evergreen students, you could argue, are maybe a little different, although I think that's more mythology, but whatever. And I think someone else said, well, why don't you photograph the hippies? They're everywhere. And I thought, God, they are. Uh, <laughs> I mean, when I first came to Evergreen years ago, I thought, God, there's hippies everywhere. But now I don't even, you know, they're just people. Um, so I put out an ad, and these are not just students. Uh, they're not just students. Some of them came from Seattle. Uh, and I, the ad just said, do you basically uh, define yourself as a hippie? And if you do, I'm going to ask you to write a paragraph, which I don't have the text here, unfortunately, uh, or a couple sentences on what makes you a hippie. And so I have people come in that look not like a hippie at all, but that they claim to be. That was all it took to get in the door and get the picture taken. He has short hair now, and he's all respectable. And I would just do these in my living room. i just turn my whole living room into a studio. And so I'd get strangers from Craigslist walking in, which I started to realize, this is a little creepy. Uh, you know, there's this one guy came in with his, like, military boyfriend, and it was clear the only reason they were hippies was because they liked weed. Took a lot of nerve of me, well, of her, I guess, too. <laughs> but to ask a stranger to breastfeed for the camera, I mean, I've never been in that position. But I asked her, and she said, OK. So along the lines of asking people, inquiring about why they feel a certain way, I decided I wanted to do something about how babies are made. Because we all know how they're made, but nobody gives you the same answer. <laughs> they all talk around the thing rather than really zeroing it in. And if they do zero in on it on more of a biological level, it just sounds wrong. You know? So um, also I wanted to experiment with the idea of a portrait, a formal portrait, portrait dimensions, not that video thing um, that speaks to you. Hopefully you'll hear this. Uh, making babies is a time-based activity. Some people think about it for a long time, and some people don't think about it at all. But I would like to think that most babies come from love. I mean, certainly not all, but you hope the majority come from love. Um, so then again, the, the, the sex which leads to a sperm fertilizing an egg, that's a time-based activity too. Sometimes it can last hours, sometimes not quite so long. And then, uh, and then that little journey of the sperm after it's left the penis somewhere in the vagina then goes up a tube and, and gets in the wall of the uterus and starts growing a bit. Um, that's the magic. You know, babies come from magic, and that, that first little journey is, uh, is one of many. 
Maybe he's come from sex. I'm not gonna play all, I'm not gonna play you still because I don't wanna embarrass you. I'm gonna play Rosemary though. Okay, so how a baby is made takes two different kinds of people. It takes a person with a penis and with testicles, who we typically call a man, and it takes a person who has a vagina and a uterus inside their body that we typically call a woman. Um, it takes the semen from a man, which, um, or the sperm from a man, which he stores inside of his testicles, and the egg from a woman, which she stores inside of her ovaries and releases one into the uterus once a month takes the egg and the sperm, combining into one single cell and becoming fertilized in order to make a baby. Um, the baby... I'm sorry, you guys. Maybe it's better off that way, I don't know. ...needs to grow inside of the uterus, and so... The sperm needs to make its way into the woman through the vagina um, and into the uterus to meet the egg in order to form the baby. And so that can be done um, through sex. The man and the woman can have sex. The penis goes inside the vagina, releases the sperm up into the vagina and through the tubes and into um, the uterus and to form a baby. Or you can inject semen if the woman doesn't want to have a baby with a man. Maybe she wants to have a baby with another woman or by herself. You can inject the sperm into the woman and the sperm will meet the egg potentially and that can form a baby as well. And that's how it's done. Their only instructions were pretend the camera is a young child. So they're like, it's a time-based activity. <laughs> All that stuff. Oh, kids with their eyes would just be like, what? And that's all I got. Thank you.